because sermons came from that. Like God was obviously speaking to me then. So, um, and I, I titled it "Who Is Your God?" And I was thinking this morning, it's kind of like that Capital One mm-hmm. commercial. You know, what's in your wallet? The guy said something like that. And what we're going to talk about today is actually the first commandment. Uh, you just join me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Your Father God. I thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. I thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to come together and study your word and spend time in fellowship with you, Lord, and, and with each other. And I pray, Lord, that you give me the words that you want to spoke and open our hearts and open our ears to hear these things that come directly from you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to start out with the passage in the Bible that we're all pretty familiar with. The Ten Commandments were given to Moses, written with God's own finger on a, on a stone for everyone. When he gave them those Ten Commandments, that was the first law that was written down. And there's, they're in an order that the order that they are for a reason, I believe. And this is the first one. I'm, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Why does he start with that? Why does he start with I am the Lord your God. Why is that first? I think it's first because everything else follows after it. In this in this world right now, there are so many gods, so many different things that we could people pick up. And in the time of the Hebrews at that point in time saw that around them too. The Egyptians had a whole pantheon of gods. They had a whole bunch of gods. Later on we get into the Greeks, in the Greek Empire, they had a whole bunch of gods. That's where all of our uh, Aesop's fables and all those things come out. The Romans, they had a whole group of gods too. Most cultures had that. The, almost all cultures have something, but most cultures had many gods. First Corinthians 8, 4-6. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in this world, and there, there is no God but one. For even if they are their so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed they are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is, there is but one God, the Father, <clears throat> from whom all things come, and, from who, and for, for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. In 1 Corinthians here, Paul is just saying, okay, I understand that they have other religions. I understand that all those things are out there. But we have to remember we serve one God. There's only one God. Everybody has a God. I think that's an absolute truth. Everyone has a God. Every person on the, on the earth has a God. What that God is is what we're talking about today. But everybody has one. Oh. Keep going, please. First quote I got here is Martin Luther's. Martin Luther said, Your God is whatever you seek as a refuge in your time of need. There's a mathematician named Pascal. He had another one. And this is one I've said before, too. Every man has a God-shaped vacuum in his heart. There's a hole in our being, in our souls, in our hearts, <coughs> that is meant to be filled with God. We are his creation. We are his creation for a purpose. And that purpose is to worship him and to love him and to spend our time in fellowship with him. So if we're missing that piece, and that's what we were created for, if we're missing that piece, there's a hole inside of us that needs to be filled. Now if we don't fill it with the one true God, what are we filling it with? If we're not filling it with with the intended things, with God, what do we fill it with? Well, let's talk about a couple things that we see today in in our everyday lives. First thing is success. People do anything for success. The ladder to success, all those kind of things. How many people lose all their integrity trying to find success? How many broken families are caused by the need to get farther ahead, to work longer hours, to do more things, to sacrifice your own family for your job, your career, whatever it is? That success becomes a God if you're willing to sacrifice for success. 
In the same way that success being what was held high in the Greeks, um, they had Zeus, the overall god like that. And then actually in um, in Greece's pantheon of gods, he was the most one, and he was the highest one. And that was important to them. It was so important that they built the idols, they built the temples, they did all this kind of stuff. And yet we do the same thing today. In our modern society, we are doing the same thing today with this desire for fame, for fortune. How much do people give up to try and get ahead? It's a race to the grave, and they're trying to get the most they can before they get there. What a sad perspective that is for someone who's got that. Another one is society. Okay? Society, and society in and of itself, when we look through history, we can think of things like governments and the different ways that people have tried to put that before God. And I don't care which government you want to pick, there's always been people that have switched that. If we look at uh, Karl Marx, the origin of communism, his belief was that if, if there was any beliefs outside of Marxism, there was no way Marxism would work. The original communist uh, party in Russia, when they got together, one of the first things they did was try and outlaw all churches. The same way they do in North Korea, the same way they did in China, the same way they do in Cuba. All those things were pushed out of the way because they realized you cannot be devoted to God and be devoted to society. You can't do both. And they didn't want anything interfering. Again, sacrificing all integrity. Next one is pleasure, and that's one that we are terribly guilty of as Americans, more so than anybody else probably. We will sacrifice anything to make ourselves happy. What do we give up so that we can go on one more vacation? How much are we giving up when we open our eyes up and stare at a television or a computer screen? Whether that pleasure comes from drugs or alcohol or anything else, whether it comes from sex, whether it comes from um, the, the constant addiction that we have to our electronics and social media, we're doing that for pleasure. <coughs> In some instances, people will almost make fun of that. You know, how many likes you have on Facebook and it becomes competitive. They'll do anything to get themselves on American Idol. They think it's all going to be sunshine and roses and they'll get everything they want. Everything you want. How many advertisements do we see where that's what they tell you? You can do anything you want. You can be anything you want. You can have everything you want if you fill in the blank. That's kind of interesting because that's kind of what Satan said, didn't he? Didn't Satan say that? Didn't he say that in the garden? Didn't he say that to Jesus? I'll give you mm -hmm. absolutely everything if you bow down and worship me. He said that to Jesus. Mm -hmm. None of these temptations are new to us. It's been around forever. That constant temptation is if you put me before God, I'll give you everything you could possibly want. Mm -hmm. You'll have a life of ease. The last one that I want to bring up here, and this is another one that is easy for us to see, is the God of self. The God of self. <clears throat> when Satan was talking to Eve, in his temptation, the first thing he said was, oh, you won't surely die. And secondly is, he's just afraid you'll become God yourself. You'll be just like God. How often do we see that being espoused as a positive? How many exercise videos, exercise things are out there? How many people spend all their time in a gym in front of a mirror? I, I've talked about this with our powerlifting and building up our weight room up there and all that kind of stuff. We've talked about it because partially we went to Eagle Butte this summer because they were tearing apart the gym and we had to go and they have mirrors in front of some of their machines. And it is helpful sometimes to watch like we're doing squats to see if your depth is right and that kind of stuff. But I also noticed another thing that happens in gyms like that. Everybody mm -hmm. looks with one shoulder, an eye over their shoulder when they're walking around trying to see each other. Trying to look around and go, what do I look like from this angle or this angle? 
Call her this end. <laughs> Go on Facebook and look at the selfies people take. They're taking pictures of themselves from all sorts of angles. You can see a tutorial on YouTube on hold, how to hold your head when you're taking a selfie to make your neck look good. Apparently there's an angle you look better at. You're better up here than down here or something like that. I don't understand. But we spend so much time on that. And there was actually a, a Roman god named Narcissus. Or, that was Greek. A Greek god named Narcissus. Narcissus looked at his own reflection in the water and lost himself staring at himself. Drowned. He actually drowned because he wanted to get closer to that pretty picture in the water. Narciss narcissism is something that is really prevalent in our society, and that's simply the love of self over all, over anything else. What happens then? Well, the same thing that happens with the other, with the other gods that we put before ourselves. Divorce. Children that get abandoned because mom or dad are off making themselves better. They're trying to find themselves. Why? You're not lost. What are you finding? The only lost you have is missing God. When you have God in your life, you don't look for anything else. But we spend so much time and so much money in this country trying to fix appearances. Cosmetic surgery, diets, all these things that people try and do because they think they'll be better, whether it's internally or externally, if they can change themselves. You can't go into a bookstore without seeing a giant self-help section. Isn't that funny? Self-help. You read a book about how to help yourself. And the funny thing is there's not one book. There's rows and rows and rows of them. So apparently there's lots of ways that, they, that people think you can help yourself. But there's only one book that really leads us to that. And that's the Bible. And that's the focus that I'm going to talk about today is, is God and God's Word and all the things that God provides. That this can't. The saddest part of this concept and the, and, the, and the terrible reality that we can all look at that and see our separation from God in this country. Look at the government. Look at what's going on right now. In this country, what is our focus? Day to day to day. Arguing, fighting, getting nasty with each other, calling each other names, dragging out all sorts of dirt. All that kind of stuff is the focus of our country. One of the things that I, I have when I'm doing, uh, I teach geography right now, world geography this semester, history next semester. When I go into world geography, one of the things I do with kids is I try and get them to look at current events. And I'll send them, where this country, what's current event in this country? What's going on in this country right now? You know what's really interesting? When I go online and I look up stuff that's going on in their country, not in our news, but in their news, and then see what they say about us. See what other countries are saying about the United States, about all the junk we got going on. It's amazing how the rest of the world views us. And the sad part is a lot of them say, for a country so blessed, they'll say right in their, in their news articles, this is what's happening. They know that we've been blessed more than most countries in the world, and yet we're tearing ourselves apart. And some of that is the fact that we've lost sight of the fact that there is one God. Just like he, he said, I am the Lord your God, there is no other God but me. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul addresses, in the beginning of 1 Thessalonians, Paul addresses this with the believers in, believers in Thessalonica, which was a part of what would now be modern day Greece. He says, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave. They tell you how you they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Paul says you got it right. Thessalonica was a city that was known for making and selling idols. They made them out of precious metals, they made them out of wood, they adorned them with all sorts of stuff. If you wanted an idol, didn't matter which one you wanted to. The shops in Thessalonica had one you could take home. You could have your own household god. Take one home and put it on a, on a shelf and make a shrine around it. You could have that. Thessalonica had a place to sell. That's what their city was known for. And Paul's saying, you're living in the midst of it and you did it right. You turned away. 
was one of the reasons when he went in and started preaching that he gets run out of some of these places because it's big business. People are mad. It's their livelihood. Don't take away the fact that I can push this. I don't think it's any different than the big business we have in this in, in our country today. Millions and billions of dollars spent on diets, on supplements, on formulas, on the next great big thing that's going to remove belly fat. All of these things coming up. People make tons and tons of money off of that. Everything's the next big thing that's going to save you. The problem is, they don't save themselves. One of the other issues that we have is this. What? 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 Oh. Is that we don't understand whether or not we have the right God. Go ahead, Pete. The world right now tells us there are many ways to God. We hold all religions as equal. We hold everything as equal. They're a good person. Everybody's a good person. I've heard people say, well, God and Allah are the same. It's all the same God. And it's not. There's a huge difference. And I don't care what anybody says about, well, it's, it's basically the same thing. No, it's not. Because God said, I am the only God. Period. That's it. I am the only God. We can't have this. And it's an uncomfortable truth. Everybody right now is so afraid of offending someone that they don't want to say it. I'll say it saying in here. There is one God. If that's not your God, you're wrong. Simple as that. People are afraid to say that now. Oh, we're so afraid of offending each other. Well, yeah, maybe some ways and some ways we're not. We're probably more offensive now than we've ever been. But, oh, we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings and tell them they're not... Well, we're not saying we're as good as you. We're saying our God is greater than anything. That's got nothing to do with how good I am. That's just the fact that God is God. And the acknowledgement that God is God is important to us. All the books, of the, all 66 books of the Bible continually go back to the fact that there is one God. He is a living God. He is an active God. He is the greatest. He is the, he is the only creator of the earth, and he never went away. That is part of what we believe. But our main belief is that there is one God, and that's where we have to focus ourselves. Pete? John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Period. This is not some sort of ambivalent statement. This is an absolute no one comes to the Father except through me is an absolute. Right. Where's God? God's residence is heaven. People think they can die without going to Jesus. Well, Jesus is the gateway to get to God, so how are you going to do that? How are you going to heaven without Jesus? You can't. And Jesus said that himself. There is no other way. This is it. So if we, in our attempt to be politically correct, ignore this fact, we're going to do so at our own peril and at everyone else's. If we can't say this, who can? If we as Christians believe this and we cannot say this out loud, who's going to do it? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Period. <coughs> that has to be as absolute a truth in our life as anything else. More so. That needs to be the life and breath of us as Christians, is understanding that. There's no way that we can encounter God through our own personal experience, through age. Our encounter with God starts with God. Now this picture up here, um, I love this painting. This is a painting by Michelangelo that's on the Sistine Chapel. It's on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. We just studied Italy and geography, and we were talking about this, and I showed him a video on this. All of my kids in my classes, I don't know how much religious training they've ever had. I don't know how saved they are. Some I do, some I don't. We go through the Vatican, we show these paintings. Every single kid that I had in that room, every single sophomore, has seen that painting. Some of them didn't know what it was about. 
for sure, but they've seen that painting. And this painting, this is just a piece of it, obviously. There are two full bodies here. But this side is God, and this side is Adam. And I think that painting is very poignant with what I'm saying today. And I think uh, a lot of those paintings in the Sistine Chapel were God inspired. I really do. Because of the beauty that was there and the way that they've held up, I think there's something special about them. But this one specifically, if you look at this, who's actively reaching for the other? Actively reaching. That's the one on the right. That's God. Actively reaching out. The other one's hand is there, but you can see he's just kind of got his hand out. Actively reaching is coming from God. We have a special relationship with the one true God because the one true God wants a special relationship with us. We didn't earn it. We didn't come up with it. It's not our idea. He wanted us. He wanted us enough that he sent his son to make that way and to make that statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He loves us so much that he opened the way. Now, when we go into the Old Testament, we look at the things in the Old Testament, we see the, the stuff there. Understanding that is a part of our belief system. Pete. Deuteronomy 6, 13, 16. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the, face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test, as you did at Massa. Our God that we serve, we should be serving him only, not following anything else. That is a problem that we have, even as Christians, even as believers today, following him only. Not in addition, not as a part of who we are, not as one of the add-ons to who we are. If I put on my list of who I am, that's one of the things on the list. No, he says, I am the only God, and the Lord your God who is among you, God is among us, is a jealous God. That's not jealousy in a negative way. That's jealousy in a positive way. That's God saying, I want you alone. To each and every individual, just like that picture, God is reaching out to you. And he says, I want you. And you're not going to get that kind of relationship with God. We're not going to get that kind of connection with God. And I talk about relationships with God a lot, but I want you to understand you can't get that third person. When, I, when we moved up here, so different than any other small town, we moved up here and it shocks me how many people are related to everybody else. <laughs> connection to connection to connection to connection. Oh, well, that's my cousin. That's my cousin. That's my brother. This is you know, all these things. <coughs> and that kind of connection is, is great. There's nothing wrong with that. And you've always, I've always had people that somebody say, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, they're a friend of my folks. Doesn't mean they're my friend. It means I know who they are, remotely. It's amazing around here, people think I know how to get everywhere. Well, you know where so-and-so lives? I have no idea. It's out in the boondock somewhere. I know Wall Ranch is south on Cherry Creek Road. I know the Hunt Ranch is down in Cherry Creek. I know Della Rosa's live out here, although they still say you live on the Donovan place. You know, we live on Wayne Martin's place. It's been a long time since Wayne's been there, too. But all of those things are association at a distance. That's all third-person association. You can't come to church and think that by coming here and listening to me, you have a relationship with God. That's not how that works. You can't watch Dr. David Jeremiah and somebody on television or listen to somebody on the radio and think, okay, that's good enough. I have a passing relationship. I have a working knowledge of God. That's not what God wants. He is a jealous God, and He wants you personally. That's why our commitment, when we when we 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 do commit to God and we get baptized and we fall on our knees and we accept that, that that means I am doing that. My parents couldn't do it for me. My wife can't do it for me. My kids can't do it for me. I have to do that. And to do that, I have to put God first in my life. 
In the Old Testament, God is referred to as Yahweh. Yahweh means I am. That's it. I am. It's a simple I am. It's an interesting concept for us. We, do, we like to put big fancy things on stuff. And he says, no, I am. That's it. I was. I will be. I am. I'm the forever God. Alpha and Omega. One true living God who is unique, incomparable, absolutely massless in the universe. And our love for him needs to be unique, uncomparable, and matchless in our lives. That's the, that's the, that is what is due him. That is where we are meant to be. The oneness of God deserves the single, singleness of our heart. Without it, we're missing the point here. God has to be loved more than the success, than the society, than the pleasure, than the self. If we don't put God in front, he's not our God. He has to be first. And that's why that was that first commandment. Now this happens again. This, this is reiterated again in the New Testament. So, Mark 12, 28-30. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, one of the reasons that, just contextually here, one of the, the teachers of the law, okay, those are the rabbis of the day. Every day, what did they do? They got together in groups and they would argue about the law. Back and forth. Minute points, back and forth, back and forth. So he hears this guy giving a good statement. He says, huh, so what do you think the best one is? I've heard this guy say this, and this guy says, what do you think the best one is? You seem to have good answers. And Jesus answers him, and he says, the most important one is this. Hear this, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. That is the first and the most important commandment. Jesus said that himself. Well, why did he say these things? Well, first of all, because it's true. And secondly, because everything else comes after that. If you can do this, the rest start to fall in place. If you don't do this, nothing will. It's that simple. It's number one for a reason. It's number one because without it, we can't do anything else. You look at the Ten Commandments. If we started at two and went through ten, we'd never be successful. We would never be able to do any of those things. There has to be a standard, and there has to be a reason, and the standard and the reason is God Almighty. Period. That's all there is. The first commandment calls us to a lifestyle of being committed and dominated by the Word of God. If we are truly loving him, that's what it does. If we truly love him with all our heart, all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, what's left? That's it. Heart, soul, mind, strength, we don't have anything else to give. Now Jesus says, well, they give it all. God gave everything for you. That's what he expects back. It's simple. It's a simple truth, but it's so hard for people to understand. But he also said this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these will be given to you as well. If you seek God first, the rest of it falls into place. Everything after that will be shadowed under the, under the wings of God. If we can put God first, everything else just falls into place. You want a good relationship with your family? Put God first. You want a good marriage with your wife or your husband? Put God first. You want success in your business so that you can be doing meaningful things? Put God first. God will take care of that other stuff. You want any of those things? You want a good relationship with your children? Put God first. Because they see you putting God first, they understand. You want happiness in this world? Put God first. You want wisdom? Start with Him. When you put these things, when you put these things in the right order, it all fits. It all fits. I remember Pete, for his birthday we got him this big Lego thing. I probably mentioned this before. It was like a yacht or something. Yeah. 
And it had a lot of pieces. Five hundred Five hundred and something, according to Pete. Um, and it had all these unique pieces. And when I was a kid, Legos were all blocks. There was little blocks and bigger blocks, but they were all blocks. There really wasn't anything. Now they got all these exciting Lego things. Well, Pete made a mistake when he got them. Okay, he didn't want to lose any pieces. It came in these little bags and stuff, and he knew those bags weren't all that good, so he wanted a Ziploc bag so that they wouldn't fall out and lose pieces. Because he's meticulous. He spent weeks putting this thing together, just perfect. You take it up <laughs> and spread it out all over the place and work on it for a while, then we tell him he had to put it away. He put it back together and then go take it out. But the mistake he made is it came in all these individual uh, little bags. Before he looked at the directions and understood that, he took everything out of the little bags and put them into one big bag. So he had all his pieces in one big bag. And then he had to, he was looking at his directions and, okay, now I've got this giant bag of things to look for. I've got this one little piece, and he'd have to look through it. Afterwards, he realized what he did. He knew what was going on. <laughs> we have to make sure we put God first or nothing else will work. We will spend our lives searching for answers. And God said, here it is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we don't put that first... We'll spend our lives trying to fill it with fill that hole, that God-shaped hole, but we'll never find it. This is challenging. It's not easy necessarily keeping God first in your life. That's not necessarily an easy thing. It's easy to let that slip and the slide and things to get in our way. And Satan loves to whisper in our ears. Will give us little challenges here and there that will take us away from God. The simple things of saying you don't really need it. I know you said you were going to read the Bible every morning, but this is a busy morning. You really need to check the weather and the news first. Just, it won't take you long. Just pop onto Facebook and, you know, and then you find yourself not reading the word because you're late. you got to get school or get to work or do something else. I'll do that later. I'll do it tonight. And then you're tired or you're focused or you're looking somewhere else and you're Family needs time, and everybody needs time. You've been away from them, and you need this as our... By the end of the day, God wasn't first. By the end of the day, when things all slid around, you never spent any time with Him. And all of it came down to a choices choices that you made. All of it came down to little choices, little pieces. The big piece in our life has to be God. That doesn't get ignored. That has to be first. God's not just something we add on. See? Matthew 22, 36-40. Again, this says, which is the greatest? The other one we came from, another gospel. This is, we're coming back to this one. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus had a lot of problems with what was going on in his day, and I think he would have a lot of problems with what's going on in our day right now. One of the biggest problems he had was with the Pharisees, and we see that all throughout the Gospels. He had problems with the Pharisees. And one of the problems he had with the Pharisees was that they weren't following this. They were all about rules and regulations and laws. And they were very proud if they followed the laws, but not the greatest law. The greatest thing was putting God first. And if they didn't do that, there were 613 individual laws for living that the Pharisees tried to follow. 613. Every single part of your life, from going to bed to waking up to what you wore to what you ate to how you washed your hands or how you washed your face, whether or not you cut your hair, your beard, the way it was all done, there were 613 different laws. And Jesus said, there's nobody who's going to be able to keep that. But he brought a new covenant, the covenant. And the Pharisees were ignoring the new covenant because they liked the old covenant. I don't know everybody in here, what you do for a living, but there may be a lawyer or two in here. But if you ever get an argument with a lawyer, and they use that circular logic on you and it just keeps going in circles. 
you don't in the end you don't really know what they were talking about they just kept you going in circles satan loves to do that because you don't get a focus you don't get a chance to say this is an absolute truth period end of story you say what you want absolute truth that's what jesus was saying here and also he said in the second part of that he says the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself and that is a concept that drawing closer to God will become easier for you to do. When we truly understand the love that God has for us, and when we have that love for Him, then that love permeates our body so much that we can't hate. We will love our neighbor as ourselves if we love God enough. That's where we miss out this love your neighbor thing. If we don't put God, God out first, we'll never, we'll never love our neighbor the way we're meant to. See? Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Excuse me. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of your cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Don't brag about the outside. Work on the inside. The outside will take care of itself. The healthiest people I've ever met worry about God first, not about exercise. Everything else can fall apart, but if God is first, your world will be held together. Things go bad. I know it does. Things will go bad on this earth. There will be earth-changing things that happen in each and every one of our lives. We will lose people we love. People will suffer. We may suffer from incurable diseases. All those things can happen. But you know what? God is still God. He is still the creator and the master of the universe, and he has still wanted a relationship with you no matter what else is going on in your life. And if we put God first, the rest of that stuff won't have the ability to crush us. It might bruise you, but it won't crush you. Matthew 15, 3. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Why is that more important than God? Why is anything more important than God? Why is anything you want to say, any, any doctrine, any arguments, um, any problems that you might have law related, why is that putting, why are you putting that before God? And unfortunately, a lot of us in our, in our Christian life here in the United States, we do that. We put up walls between us instead of opening doors because of God. In addition to this, John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my command. So God says, I am your God. I am the one and only living God. I have no other God before me. What does that mean? Do you love me? If you love me, you believe in me. If you put me first, you'll love me. And if you love me, you'll keep all my commands. It's not an issue. When Jesus was talking to Peter after the resurrection, and Peter's heart's broken because he knew he had denied Christ, he says, Peter, do you love me? And he asked it three times. But he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. You know I love you. He said, then feed my land, then do my work, then go out there and get working, get to get busy. If you love me, you should be doing something right now. You have a job to do, I gave you a job. The crux of this as an individual, as it comes back to us, is this. Who is our God? Who do we put first? Where do we put ourselves in this hierarchy? Is God above, below, beside, or beneath us? It's that simple. I think of the image of the cross here when I say things like that. Is God here? Is he at the top of your life? Is he over on the side somewhere where, yeah, he's, he's kind of with me. I'm walking with God, but I'm not letting him lead. I'm just walking beside him. That doesn't work. God says that doesn't work either. Or is God somewhere beneath us? No. 
God says, I am a jealous God. And you will only follow me. A simple command. First John. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And then in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Both of these people were writing with the intent of helping people to understand this concept of loving God. Helping understanding the concept of how deep and wide God's love is for us. And simply saying, do it then. If God is first in your life, do it. Act like it. And I'm going to close with this. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Mm -hmm. High standard here. As I have loved you, uh -huh. so you must love one another. There is no greater love than God sending his son. And there is no greater love than Jesus dying for us. The two greatest loves we've ever seen in the world, that's ever been and ever existed, is God's love for us, and Christ's love for us, that he loved us enough to die. And Jesus says, love each other like I love you. If you want to get it right, you must love one another. So I think as individuals, we need to search our own soul. Is God first? And as James and, and John were